The 20 year old sophomore vanished after a night out with friends in Bloomington back in 2011. There are so many unfortunate and terrible stories about people gone missing. Some cases were never even solved. Harold Holt vanished while swimming off Victoria's. It was the middle of the Cold War and his body was never found. But what exactly happened on days when people disappeared? And what have they become? From the disappearance of young Martha Jean Lambert to little Antoinette Cayadito, here are the 20 most mysterious disappearances you've ever heard. Number 20, Martha Jean Lambert. On November 27th, 1985, during Thanksgiving, a 12-year-old girl mysteriously disappeared in the middle of the night in St. Augustine, Florida. This girl was named Martha Jean Lambert. Little Martha was a nice and lively little girl who got along with her two older brothers. The three of them used to play together a lot. Due to a complicated family situation involving alcoholism and abuse, Martha grew up in different foster homes. For Thanksgiving 1985, the whole family gathered at Martha's grandmother's house. However, the young girl vanished. That's right. After school, Martha stayed at one of her friend's houses before returning home. Once back, she stepped outside for a few minutes, but never returned. No trace of her was ever found, and due to a lack of evidence, the case grew cold. 25 years after her disappearance, the investigation was reopened. Investigators started recollecting all the testimonies that had been conducted back in the 1980s. One of Martha's brothers, David, who was 14 years old at the time and now in his 30s, was questioned. 24 years after this girl vanished, her brother made a disturbing confession. That's right, much to the police's surprise, David Lambert finally confessed to his crime. He was responsible for Martha's death and disappearance. After fighting with his sister, David had apparently accidentally killed her. David Lambert was not convicted, especially since the little girl's body could not be found a building having been built on the place where David claims to have buried her. Number 19, Antoinette Cayadito. I want her to be safe wherever she is. Back in 1986, Antoinette Cayadito, a nine-year-old girl, was kidnapped in the middle of the night. To this day, no one knows what happened to her. It all happened in Gallup, a city in New Mexico where a small community of 18,000 inhabitants lives peacefully. Penny, a single mother of three, decided to wake her three daughters. But Antoinette, the eldest, was missing. The main door, which was usually closed, was wide open. But Penny wasn't too alarmed. After all, her daughter might have gone to the neighbor's house. However, when Antoinette didn't return home that day, her mother decided to alert people. A massive search involving the help of the entire neighborhood took place for several days. Very quickly, Penny realized that something serious had happened to her daughter, and the police started an investigation. They quickly surmised that the young girl might have been But what exactly happened? Penny said that the day before her daughter's disappearance, she went out for drinks with friends while a nanny looked after the little girls. Penny reached home at midnight, the girls were there, and all three were asleep in the same room. Sadie, Antoinette's younger sister, affirmed that she had heard someone knocking at the door in the middle of the night, saying, hurry up, it's cold outside. Sadie didn't realize the voices and waited for the people to leave before going back to bed. A couple of years later, Sadie admitted that a certain Uncle Joe had asked for the door to be opened for him. As soon as he opened it, he forced Antoinette into his van. Frightened, the young girl did not dare to talk about it for many years. One year later, the police received a phone call from a young girl claiming to be Antoinette Cayadito. During this phone call, Antoinette barely had time to speak before someone cut the line. Unfortunately, this call was too short to trace. A call for witnesses was launched but led nowhere. Four years later, a waitress reported an incident while she was serving a neglected couple accompanied by a young girl. This little girl tried to catch the waitress's attention, but in vain. When the family left, the waitress found a note that was left behind and read, help me, call the police. What do you think happened to Antoinette? Was she by a family member or this Uncle Joe? Number 18, Ryan Chambers. In India, Rishikesh had always attracted Western visitors. In 1968, the Beatles even settled there for a bit to learn about transcendental meditation. Back in 2005, the place was visited by two young Australian men, John Booker and his best mate, Ryan Chambers. Both had grown up together in Adelaide and knew each other from kindergarten. They departed for India on June 20th, seeking spiritual experiences. Two months later, the two friends reached the Sri Ved Niketan Ashram in Rishikesh, which offers daily yoga classes and meditation. They intended to explore the country for eight months, However, around August 20th, 21-year-old Ryan contacted his family and expressed his desire to return home. 
The young man had apparently visited everything he wanted to see. His friend, John, therefore, helped him book a flight through a travel agency. But it seemed that Ryan had changed his mind in the middle of the night because he went missing the following day. That's right, Ryan had apparently left the ashram at 5 a.m., wearing only shorts and leaving behind all of his belongings. His friend, John, informed his family that Ryan hadn't been quite himself and wasn't sleeping properly either. Ryan has not made contact with anyone since that day. However, a glimmer of hope appeared a week after Ryan's disappearance. He was apparently seen 10 kilometers away from Rishikesh in a temple. Ryan was apparently in a state of distress and delusion, likely due to sleep exhaustion. Although the priest provided food and drink, Ryan was unable to stay and leave. The investigation related to this disappearance hit a dead end. What do you think happened to Ryan Chambers? Number 17, Brandon Swanson. The name Brandon Swanson probably means nothing to you. However, his mysterious disappearance one night in May 2008 caused a stir in the state of Minnesota. On May 14th, 2008, it was 2 a.m. when Brian Swanson received a call from his son. Brandon, 19, said he slid into a ditch in his pickup while returning from a college party in Canby on the campus of the University of Minnesota. He was near Lind, about 10 kilometers south of the family home, located in Marshall. His parents decided to go and look for him, but couldn't find him. The young student decided to abandon his vehicle and reach Lind on foot. He was still on the phone with his father on his way, but around 2.30 a.m., the conversation took a tragic turn. Oh shit, Brandon exclaimed before falling into silence. This is the last time Brian Swanson will hear his son's voice. After wandering the surrounding roads looking for Brandon, Brian and Annette Swanson reported him missing at 6.30 a.m. Lind police did not immediately take their concerns seriously, saying it was not uncommon for a student of that age to come home late from a party. Nevertheless, research ended up being organized. The surroundings of Lynn were examined, but one element disrupted the investigation. Brandon's cell phone tracing indicated that the teenager was not in Lind at all the night before, but in the vicinity of Taunton on State Route 68, linking Canby to Marshall. With this information, it only took investigators a few hours to find Brandon's Chevrolet Lumina on the side of the road. The teenager had disappeared. Still using telephone tracing, Lincoln County Police estimated that at the time of his disappearance, Brandon was within a five-mile radius of a cell tower located near Miniota, another town on the border of Route 68. Large-scale excavations were then organized, but Brandon couldn't be found anywhere. According to Brandon's parents, it is possible that their son was he was very alert on the phone and could not have disappeared. Nothing explains why Brandon thought he was near Lind when he was 30 kilometers further north, a mystery that may never be solved. Number 16, Margaret Ellen Fox. On June 24th, 1974, a young girl named Margaret Ellen Fox disappeared while she was on her way to meet someone who had answered her babysitting ad. The 14-year-old girl, who was from Burlington City in New Jersey, got off at the Mount Holly bus stop and was never seen again. Hours later, the parents of the teenage girl received a ransom call from a man who demanded $10,000 in exchange for their daughter. According to the FBI, all calls received at the family's home were recorded, but still no traces of young Margaret were found. Authorities have asked anyone with information to come forward, and the FBI even announced a $25,000 reward for information leading to an arrest or conviction in this case. Margaret Ellen Fox would be 49 today. Number 15, Marjorie West. On Sunday, May 8th, 1938, a little girl named Marjorie West disappeared in Marshburg, Pennsylvania. After mass, Shirley and Cecilia West decided to celebrate Mother's Day with their three children, Dorothea, 11 years old, Alan, seven years old, and Marjorie, four years old. On the edge of the Allegheny National Forest, the little family met a couple of friends, Mr. and Mrs. Lloyd Ackerland. The men prepared for fishing while Cecilia West returned to the car to rest, and her daughters, Dorothea and Marjorie, had fun picking wildflowers. The two little girls created a pretty bouquet of violets. Dorothea walked away to show it to her mother, but when she came back, there was no trace of her little sister. Assuming that Marjorie had decided to play hide and seek, as she usually did, the little girl went looking for her. But besides the bouquet of violets that Marjorie had in her hand, Dorothea returned empty-handed. The Wests quickly alerted the authorities. Hundreds of men helped the police in the investigation and started searching for the missing girl. On May 10th, a sniffer dog followed the little girl's trail to a double-locked chalet, but inside, there was nothing to indicate that Marjorie had been there. In the space of a week, 60 kilometers squared were searched by thousands of volunteers. Unfortunately, none of these efforts, nor any of the many avenues explored by investigators, made it possible to find a trace of the child. 85 years later, little Marjorie West remains officially missing. However, 
In the early 2000s, Harold Thomas Beck, the former editor-in-chief of the Mountain Laurel Review, published a book called Finding Marjorie West. Beck was later contacted by a woman claiming that Marjorie West was one of her colleagues and went by the name of Sylvia Waldrop London. Beck contacted Mrs. London, but she supposedly denied any connection with the missing girl before admitting, a few years later, that she was Marjorie West. According to Harold Beck, Sylvia London revealed that she learned from her mother when she was on her bed that her father had her from a park when she was just a child. Unfortunately, Sylvia Waldrop London's version has never been proven. She February 27th, 2009, taking with her the truth about the disappearance of little Marjorie West. Number 14, Evelyn Hartley. In 1953, on the night of October 24th, 15-year-old Evelyn Grace Hartley disappeared without a trace in the town of La Crosse in Wisconsin. Decades later, her disappearance remained unsolved, leaving behind a haunting mystery that continues to captivate the minds of locals and true crime enthusiasts. Evelyn Hartley was a bright and promising 15-year-old girl. She was an honor student at Central High School in La Crosse and was known for her intelligence and kindness. On the evening of October 24, 1953, Evelyn arrived at the home of Professor Vigo Rasmussen, a colleague of her father, to watch their 20-month-old daughter, Janice. Although Evelyn had only been babysitting for a year, she had a habit of contacting her parents by phone at some point in the evening. When the clock struck nine and there was no news from Evelyn, her father, Richard Hartley, became concerned. He quickly went to the Rasmussen's and found all the doors and windows locked. Through a bay window, he noticed his daughter's glasses and one of her shoes placed on the living room floor. Panic set in when he noticed footprints and bloodstains leading away from the house. With a sinking feeling in his heart, Richard knew something was seriously wrong. He crawled through an open basement window, discovering Evelyn's other shoe lying on the basement floor. Upstairs, the living room carpets were ruffled and showed evidence of a struggle. Richard wasted no time in notifying the police. The disappearance of Evelyn Hartley sent shockwaves through the town of La Crosse, sparking an unprecedented search effort that involved more than 2,000 people. Law enforcement officers, volunteers, and even Air Force helicopters scoured the five-mile radius surrounding the Rasmussen home. River patrols searched the waterways, cliffs, and woods. Every swamp and cave was meticulously examined. Despite the tireless efforts of the searching teams, Evelyn's whereabouts remained a mystery. Evidence at the scene seemed to support the theory that Evelyn had been in the years since Evelyn's disappearance, several suspects have emerged, but no concrete evidence was found. Number 13, the Sodder. On Christmas Eve, 1945, the Sodder family was enjoying a quiet evening. Parents Jenny and George Sodder had decided to go to bed while some of their children continued to play in the attic. Shortly after midnight, both parents woke up to a strange smell of smoke. The office of the father, George, was in flames. The parents tried to save five of their children in the attic, but were unable to climb the staircase that was completely covered by smoke and flames. The rest of the family escaped the house while George tried to find a ladder, and Jenny called for help. But that evening, the ladder was nowhere to be found, and the phone was cut off. The firefighters arrived too late, and the house was completely destroyed. What makes the story super mysterious is that not a single trace of the children who were playing in the attic was found, not even their bones. An investigation was conducted since the Sodders were convinced that this fire was not accidental. They thought it was a criminal act. Investigators concluded that the bodies of the children had been burned down. However, a bus driver later revealed that he saw people throwing some sort of fireballs towards the house. Since the Sodders' children have disappeared, different theories have emerged. Some believe that the Italian mafia probably killed them, while other people think that they might have been taken by aliens. What do you think happened? Number 12, Lauren Spirer. Back in 2011, Lauren Spirer, who was a young 20-year-old student, disappeared after spending an evening with friends and classmates at Indiana University, where she had studied fashion merchandising. The young woman, who was originally from Scarsdale in the state of New York, was last seen around 4.15 a.m. by a friend who told authorities she was walking barefoot toward her apartment. Witnesses reported that Lauren had been very drunk and had used drugs that night. The 20-year-old did not have her mobile phone when she disappeared and left her shoes at Kilroy Sports Bar, where she had gone earlier in the night. There have been hundreds and hundreds of tips and leads in the case. In 2015, it was suspected that Lauren's case may have been linked to that of another missing girl called Hannah Wilson, who had also visited Kilroy's sports bar on the night of her disappearance. However, Hannah's was located, and it is now unclear whether police still consider the two cases to be linked. In 2016, a man named Corey Hammersley was questioned by a private investigator regarding Lauren's disappearance. Hammersley was in jail at the time on unrelated charges, but was questioned in response to a tip Lauren's parents claimed came to them. According to this tip, Hammersley allegedly told his neighboring inmate that he knew Lauren had overdosed on ecstasy in the presence of three men. 
The men were afraid and threw her body away. During the interview, Hammersley denied the conversation ever took place and claimed he had no involvement in Lauren's disappearance. In 2021, a TikTok video surfaced alleging conspiracies involving Lauren and an online gambling scheme. A few days later, Lauren's family announced that they had reported a TikTok video to the police for further investigation, but did not specify which video it was. Number 11, Lars Mittank. In July 2014, a young German named Lars Mittank disappeared without a trace at the Varna airport in Bulgaria. His sudden disappearance, filmed on airport security footage, intrigued investigators and sparked numerous theories. Lars Mittank's journey began on June 30th, 2014, when he and his friends traveled from Berlin to the resort town of Golden Sands, Bulgaria. It was supposed to be a month-long vacation filled with relaxation and fun. Mittank, a fan of the Werder Bremen football club, enjoyed the company of his friends and the holiday atmosphere of the resort. However, things took an unexpected turn on July 6th, when Mitank and his friends had a heated argument with a group of men over their favorite football clubs. The disagreement escalated and Mitank was allegedly attacked by four individuals, resulting in an injury to his jaw and a ruptured eardrum. His friends witnessed the confrontation but were unable to prevent the altercation. The incident marked the beginning of a series of strange events that would ultimately lead to Mitank's disappearance. Following the altercation, Mitank's behavior took a sudden and disturbing turn. He became increasingly paranoid, convinced that someone was trying to harm him. He left the resort and checked into the Color Varna Hotel, where he made a series of distressing phone calls to his mother, Sandra Mitank. He was expressing his fear of being robbed or and urged his mother to cancel her credit cards. The hotel's closed-circuit television cameras captured Mitank's erratic behavior in the halls, where he even hid in an elevator. His actions were indicative of a person in a state of extreme anxiety. On July 8th, the day Mitank was due to return to Germany, he arrived at the Varna airport. He sought medical advice from Dr. Kosta Kostov, the airport doctor, about his ear injury and the antibiotics he had been prescribed. Kostov deemed him fit to travel and reassured him that everything would be fine. However, Mitank's doubts about persisted, and his anxiety reached a boiling point. Witnesses reported that Mitank abruptly stood up from his chair in the doctor's office and exclaimed, I don't want to I have to get out of here. He fled the office, leaving behind all his belongings, including his wallet, cell phone, and passport. Security cameras captured his desperate escape as he ran through the airport scaled the fence and disappeared into a nearby forest, never to be seen again. Following Mitank's disappearance, extensive searches were conducted in the surrounding area, but no trace of him was found. The case has attracted considerable attention, with CCTV footage from the airport being viewed millions of times on YouTube. Despite widespread publicity and the efforts of law enforcement, the fate of Lars Mitank remains unknown. Number 10, Mara Murray. Mara Murray was born in 1982, and was a very beautiful young girl who had just started college. Everyone agreed that she was gentle, kind, and never got into trouble. However, her close friends confessed that she was very different in private. Mara had the bad habit of stealing things. These thefts are generally of no importance or great consequence, but once she stole a credit card that she found on the ground and used it to buy $200 in three months of food. Mara often stole food, not out of necessity, but because she suffered from bulimia. It was following this theft that she became known to the police for the first time. On February 8, 2004, at 2 p.m., Mara started acting strangely. She went online on MapQuest, the ancestor of Google Maps, in order to trace several itineraries that were often at complete opposite ends to one another, but always within the United States. She then sent several emails. One was to her boyfriend to apologize for being distant and promise to give him a call. Others were sent to her teachers and announced that she would be absent for about a week because she had to attend the funeral of one of her relatives. However, her family would later state that this was a lie, as no were reported among Mara's family or friends. Later on, Mara called the reserve apartments in the state of Vermont. She only took a few clothes, her credit card, and got in her car to leave the campus at 3.30 p.m. At 3.40 p.m., Mara stopped and withdrew $280 to buy $40 worth of alcohol. A last image of her was taken then. Later that day, at 7 p.m., her car was found in the state of Hampshire. A woman called the police to report an accident, but Mara was never found. No leads, no suspects, she vanished. And you, what do you think happened to Mara? Did she run away? Was she kidnapped or abducted? Number nine, Eitan Patz. On May 25th, 1979, just before Memorial Day weekend, which marks the start of the summer period in the United States, six-year-old Eitan Patz was allowed by his parents to walk alone to his bus stop school. The Potts family resided in a loft in the Soho neighborhood of New York, which at the time was still an artistic and relatively quiet neighborhood where residents knew each other. That morning, Eitan walked two blocks toward West Broadway, where the bus was supposed to pick him up, but the little boy was never dropped off and did not return home. 
His parents immediately alerted the police in the afternoon. An investigation was opened and conducted for more than 30 years. For decades, Eitan's parents did not leave their loft or change their phone number, holding out the hopes that their son would one day return or contact them. Despite the distribution of Eitan's photograph on milk cartons and prints that were shared all over the state of New York, the little boy was never found, and his disappearance became one of the most famous crime stories in the United States. For the New York police, Jose Antonio Ramos, a pedophile who claimed to have known the boy's babysitter, was the main suspect in the disappearance of Eitan Potts, who was later declared in 2001. However, the story took another unexpected turn in 2017 with the indictment of another suspect. Pedro Hernandez, 51, confessed to the New York police that he was Eitan's At the time, Hernandez was 19 and worked at a bodega across the street from the bus stop where Eitan was supposed to wait. Hernandez informed the police that he lured the child with a cold drink into the store, strangled him, placed him in a trash bag, and threw him nearby that same evening. When he returned a few days later, the bag and the child's body were missing. Police took these confessions seriously but maintained some skepticism since this new suspect had no criminal record and a significant psychiatric history, suffering from schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Pedro Hernandez had reportedly confessed to the child's telling his family and prayer group shortly afterward that he did something terrible and killed the child in New York. Hernandez was living in Soho at the time before moving to New Jersey in May 1979, where he has since resided with his daughter and second wife. Number eight, Springfield Three. On June 7, 1992, 19-year-old Susie Streeter, her 47-year-old mother, Cheryl Levitt, and her friend Stacy McCall, 18 years old, mysteriously disappeared without a trace in downtown Springfield. The day before, Stacy and Susie were celebrating their high school graduation. According to the police, after being at a few graduation parties, the two friends went to Susie's house where Susie's mother was staying. That was the last time anyone reported seeing the three women. The only thing that was seen that night was a green van. The three women left all their belongings behind, including their cars and purses. With the help of the FBI, the Missouri State Highway Patrol, and numerous other law enforcement agencies, the Springfield Police Department says authorities conducted a thorough investigation into the lives of the missing women, but there have been no positive leads regarding the reason for their disappearance or their location. In 1993, investigators searched 40 acres in Webster County that had been searched in a previous missing persons case. In 1996, Robert Craig Cox, formerly convicted of murdering a woman in Florida and who was in Springfield at the time of the disappearance, was interviewed by a reporter. Although Cox was questioned extensively, the man claimed that he was home that night. He was not convicted for the disappearance of the Springfield Three. Later on in 2002, investigators searched a concrete factory located in Webster County. After being told that men were driving a green truck there, sniffer dogs were brought to the location and found some bones. But after being tested, it turned out that these bones were far too old to belong to the three women. Other tips were given throughout the years, but none led to concrete evidence. In 2007, after speculation that the women were buried under a Cox South Hospital parking lot, a local writer hired a consulting engineer who used ground-penetrating radar to scan the garage. The man operating it said his machine spotted three separate objects. Springfield police looked into this theory and found it not credible. They never asked for the concrete in the parking lot to be destroyed to search under it. Springfield residents still wonder where the missing women might be, while the question of what happened to them remains a mystery. Number seven, Rebecca Coriam. Imagine being on a cruise boat and suddenly disappearing. Well, that's what happened to Rebecca Coriam, an employee of Disney Cruise Line. Becca, as she was called, was accompanying a group of children on board the Disney Wonder, a ship which was supposed to travel on a seven-day cruise along the western front of Mexico. However, one day, on March 22nd, Becca didn't show up for duty and has never given a sign of life since the previous night. The young girl had gone missing while Disney Wonder was sailing across the Bahamas. Therefore, the island's police took charge of the investigation. The Mexican Navy and the U.S. Coast Guard were also assigned to the case. The entire boat was searched and everything was examined, but nothing relating to Becca's disappearance was found. Disney Cruise Line officials indicated that they had notified authorities of the young girl's disappearance as quickly as possible. Just before disappearing, Rebecca made a phone call from the boat, but there was no way to figure out what she said and to whom she talked. The Disney Wonder can carry up to 2,500 passengers and 1,000 crew members. That's a lot. A wanted notice was issued to the other passengers, but still no trace of Rebecca Coriam. Number six, Zeb Quinn. Born on May 12, 1981, Zeb Wayne Quinn was only 18 years old when he suddenly went missing. At that time, Zeb was enrolled in a Reserve Officers Training Corps, ROTC program, and dreamed of joining the armed forces as a commissioned officer as soon as possible. However, he didn't know he would never get the chance to do so as he disappeared without a trace after his shift 
in his hometown of Asheville on January 2, 2000. Zeb worked until 9 p.m. that evening. He planned to drive to Leicester in North Carolina with a co-worker to purchase a new car, but he never visited the area and never returned home. Zeb was last seen on surveillance cameras at a Walmart where he purchased sodas around 9.15 p.m. before leaving. Everything seemed perfectly normal on the tape. His mother became concerned and filed a police report the next afternoon. Four days later, on January 6, 2000, Zeb's vehicle was found abandoned in the parking lot of a barbecue restaurant in Asheville. The headlights of the car were still on and inside were found a black Labrador puppy. I know, weird, right? A plastic hotel key card, several drink bottles, and a jacket that was not Zeb's. Despite all this, forensic evidence yielded no new information meaning nothing clarified where the teen might have been that night. He is now presumed dead as part of the investigation, but his remains have not been located. Therefore, no further details are known. Number five, Harold Holt. Harold Edward Holt was an Australian statesman that was born in 1908 in Sydney. He was the 17th prime minister of Australia in 1966. But his term ended dramatically in December 1967 when he disappeared while swimming in Victoria. No one knows what happened to Harold Holt. That day, the man simply dived and vanished. Holt spent 32 years in Parliament, but only served as Prime Minister for 22 months. On Sunday morning of December 17, 1967, Holt and a few friends went to Melbourne to see the British Alec Rose sail during his solo sailing journey around the world. Around midday, the group settled at one of Holt's favorite swimming spots on Cheviot Beach at Point Nipian near Portsea in the eastern part of Port Phillip Bay. Holt decided to swim even though the sea was very agitated. In addition, Cheviot Beach is known for the strength and dangerousness of its currents. Holt might have wanted to impress his friends and ignore them when they had advised him not to go. The Prime Minister decided to dive and was never seen again. Fearing the worst, his friends directly alerted the police. Navy divers and volunteers searched the entire coast, but no trace of Holt was found. Two days later, on December 19th, the government officially announced that Holt was to be considered. What do you think happened to him? Number four, D.B. Cooper. More than 50 years ago, D.B. Cooper remains the only hijacker to escape American authorities. On the eve of Thanksgiving 1971, Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305 was scheduled to take off in the afternoon from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. Some 200 kilometers separate the two cities. For the 36 passengers and six crew members, the flight should have lasted around 30 minutes. Among the passengers, there was a certain man who was known as Dan Cooper. Witnesses described him as a white man in his 40s, dressed in a suit and tie, wearing black sunglasses. Dan Cooper ordered a bourbon soda and smoked some cigarettes. It was a routine flight until it turned into a hostage taking. Shortly after takeoff, the man handed a piece of paper to Florence Schaffner, one of the stewardesses. The piece of paper will never be found, but according to Florence Schaffner, capital letters were written on it and affirmed that the passenger was in possession of a bomb that he demanded that the stewardess take a seat next to him and that the plane was about to be hijacked. He whispered to her, Madame, you better take a look at this note. I have a bomb. He opened his briefcase and showed to Schaffner what appeared to be an explosive device. Schaffner informs the captain of the hijacker's demands, a ransom of $200,000, four parachutes, and a tanker truck on the tarmac of the Seattle airport in order to refuel the Boeing 727. Once the authorities were informed, the Northwest Orient Airlines gathered everything that was requested. Once in Seattle, the exchange took place. The 35 passengers and two crew members, including Florence Schaffner, were released, while Cooper recovered the money and the parachutes. The plane took off again in the early evening towards Mexico, with the remaining crew members and Cooper on board. He was described as very calm, courteous, and in control of events. But Cooper did not reach Mexico. Around 8 p.m., he ordered the crew to lock themselves into the cockpit and opened the stairway door at the rear of the aircraft. The plane was at an altitude of 3,000 meters when he decided to jump into the void with the ransom and a parachute on him. D. Cooper disappeared into the night. A gigantic manhunt was immediately launched. For weeks, Cooper was hunted. His sketch was displayed, and a reward was promised for any information leading to his capture. But nothing helped. The hijacker was nowhere to be found. No one knows if he even survived his jump. The FBI investigated the case, codenamed Norjack, for years. Hundreds of people were questioned. In February 1980, Brian Ingram, an eight-year-old child, discovered three wads of largely disintegrated bills on a sandbar along the Columbia River. Analysis and serial numbers confirmed that these were the notes from the ransom given to D.B. Cooper, but this is far from enough to close the investigation, and the FBI closed the unsolved case. 
Number three, Amelia Earhart. In 1937, a famous pilot named Amelia Earhart disappeared with her navigator, Fred Noonan. They were last seen in Ley in New Guinea on July 2nd, 1937. For four months, the American government launched around 50 planes in search of them, but in vain. Amelia Mary Earhart was born in 1897 and was an American aviation pioneer. She was the first woman to cross the Atlantic Ocean by plane. However, her disappearance at sea remains an unsolved mystery to this day. Amelia's fascination for aviation started in 1920 when her father took her to visit an airfield. The pilot Frank Hawk took them on a first flight that would change her life. She would later say that while she was in the air, she suddenly knew she had to fly. Working in various jobs to save money, she managed to afford flying lessons from another aviation pioneer, Anita Nita Snook, in January 1921. Six months later, she bought a yellow biplane that she named the Canary. On October 22, 1922, Earhart reached the altitude of 4,300 meters, a record for a female aviator at that time. On May 15, 1923, she became the 16th woman to obtain her pilot's license. She continued her own flights and became the first woman to make a round trip to North America. On May 20th, 1932, Amelia flew from Newfoundland and Labrador for a solo flight of 14 hours and 56 minutes to Northern Ireland. She became the first woman to cross the Atlantic alone in a plane. Unfortunately, in the summer of 1937, the woman disappeared and no sign of her was ever recovered. Quite a life though. Does it make you want to be more adventurous? Number two, Nicole Morin. On the 30th of July, 1985, in the Etobicoke neighborhood of Toronto, little Nicole Morin, age eight, picked up the intercom in her apartment. In the receiver, her friend's voice tells her that she is waiting for her downstairs to go to the swimming pool. Nicole agreed to meet her with her in the lobby. She put on her peach colored swimsuit, her green headband, and her red canvas shoes and leaves the apartment. 15 minutes later, the intercom rings again. This time it's Nicole's mother, Jeanette Morin, who picks up. Downstairs, Nicole's friend is still waiting. She's surprised that the little girl hadn't come down yet. Her mother speculated that Nicole went to the swimming pool alone, but that is not the case. The little girl had simply disappeared. The building was searched from top to bottom. Riders, soldiers, helicopters, and sniffer dogs were all mobilized to find little Nicole. The police knocked on all the doors and broke down those that didn't answer. So a neighbor directed investigators to a first lead. 45 minutes before Nicole disappeared, he remembered seeing a young blonde woman with a notebook sitting on the floor not far from Nicole's apartment. Unfortunately, the police were unable to identify her. At the same time, investigators found a note in the family apartment on which Nicole had written, I am going to disappear. All members of her family were questioned and suspected, but the police found nothing suspicious in the girl's entourage. A total of $1.8 million were invested and 25,000 people were requisitioned for the investigation. It is to this date the largest disappearance investigation in the history of the Toronto Police Service. Number one, Walter Collins. On March 10th, 1928, nine-year-old Walter Collins asked his mother, Christine, for money to go to the cinema. She handed him money and sent him on his way, but she never saw him again. Los Angeles police quickly began searching for the boy, but they returned empty-handed. Then five months later, a child claiming to be Walter arrived in Illinois. Although Christine Collins insisted that this boy was not her son, the police insisted that he was and even forced her into a psychiatric ward as she continued to deny being his mother. The boy eventually admitted that he wasn't Walter Collins at all. Around the same time, investigators stumbled upon a crime scene at a ranch in Winneville, 50 miles away from Los Angeles. There, a man named Gordon Stewart Northcott, young boys with the help of his mother, Sarah Louise Northcott, Although the police never found physical evidence linking Northcott to Walter's disappearance, the verbally admitted boy and Sarah Norcott also told the police that she was involved in Walter's. She was ultimately sentenced to life in prison for Walter's. But the mystery surrounding the boy's disappearance and the series of bizarre events that followed remain fascinating and super mysterious. Do you know of any other person that mysteriously vanished one day? Which of these stories did you find most intriguing? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.